Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of TED Climate, a podcast from the TED Audio Collective. I'm your host, Dan Cortler, and today I want to get into something personal, a question that drives my everyday existence, something I find myself asking constantly. It kind of occupies my every other thought. What am I going to eat today? I'm guessing I'm not alone in this. Uh, Food is more than just the fuel that keeps us alive. It's one of life's main sources of joy, in my opinion. And our cultures and societies have evolved around different cuisines. But, as you may know, our modern food production is incredibly problematic. From factory farms to overfishing, I don't need to depress you with the stats you've probably already heard. When it comes to food production, there's a lot to cover. Certainly too much for a 10-minute podcast. So today, rather than exploring the bigger topics that you hear about all the time, we're going to narrow in on some specific questions. First, a question that likely comes up every time you have a coffee or go to the store, and one that's often discussed in terms of both its health and environmental impacts. Which kind of milk should you buy? And does it even make a difference? There are a dizzying number of milk products to choose from. First, you got dairy milk, of course, but there's also the plant-based milks, the most popular being almond, soy, and oat. Each of these has a different journey to the grocery aisle, and they're all made up of different nutrients. So the question is, which should we choose? Well, let's take a look at the nutritional value first. One 250 milliliter glass of cow's milk contains 8 grams of protein, 12 grams of carbohydrates, and 2 to 8 grams of fat, depending on if it's skim, reduced fat, or whole. If we're looking at what an average adult needs, that's approximately 15% their daily protein, 10% their daily carbohydrates, and 2-15% to their daily fat. Most of your plant-based milks have less carbohydrates than dairy milk. They also have less fat, but more of what's called the good fats. However, the healthy nutrients vitamin D and calcium that are found in dairy milk don't occur naturally in most plant-based milks. And looking more closely at each, Almond milk has way less protein than dairy and less overall nutrients than compared to oat and soy, so almond milk is not winning the nutrition game. Oat milk also has less protein than dairy, but it is full of beta-glucans, a healthy type of fiber. It also has a lot of carbohydrates compared to other plant milks, sometimes even as much as dairy. And soy milk has as much protein as cow's milk and is also a great source of potassium. You may have heard um, that soy milk has these things called isoflavins in it. Some people used to worry that the isoflavones in soybeans might trigger hormonal imbalances by mimicking the function of estrogen, but it turns out there's not enough to really affect our bodies. You'd have to drink a shocking amount of soy milk. So, which of these things is best for you? Well, nutrition-wise, pretty much any of them. For people who don't have access to a wide and varied diet, dairy milk can be the most efficient way to get these nutrients, but all else being equal, any one of these four milks should be nutritious enough to be a part of a balanced diet. That's why, for many people, the milk that's best for you is actually the milk that's best for the planet. What? Where'd you think this was going? This podcast isn't called TED Nutrition. This is TED Climate. So, which uses the fewest resources and produces the least pollution? Well, it takes almost four square kilometers to produce just one glass of cow's milk, land use that drives deforestation and habitat destruction. While most of that is land the cows live on, some is used to grow their feed, which is often made of soybeans and oats. And it takes much more land to feed a cow than it does to make soy or oat milk. To produce one glass of soy, oat, or almond milk, you only need about a quarter of a square kilometer. But where that land is also matters. Soybean farms are a major driver of deforestation, while oat and almond farms are not. Making milk uses water every step of the way, but it's the farming stage where big differences start to emerge. Dairy milk uses the most water by far. It's 120 liters per glass, mostly for the cows to drink and to grow their food. But almond milk takes second place at more than 70 liters of water per glass. Most of that water is used to grow almond trees, which take years of watering before they start producing nuts. All told, soy and oats require less water to grow, only about 5 to 10 liters per glass of milk. Milk production also generates some greenhouse gas emissions, about 0.1 to 0.2 kilograms per glass for the plant-based milks. But for dairy milk, the cows themselves also produce emissions by burping and farting large quantities of methane. Overall, each glass of dairy milk contributes over half a kilogram of greenhouse gases, and these same emissions are a big part of why beef production is so bad for the environment. So, which milk should you choose? Drumroll please, Sheena. 
But when it comes to helping the planet, there's a strong case for choosing plant-based milks, even with the water needed for almonds. But if you can have your pick, oat and soy milk go down the smoothest. Well, this is just great news for my lactose intolerant friend. She always forgets her lactate. And oat milk is good for her digestion and the planet. But maybe you're not like her. Maybe you love dairy milk. And I mean, I get it. Or even if you're okay with drinking less dairy, maybe you really don't want to give up some of your other favorite foods. And I hear you. Something that's helped me wrap my head around all this was realizing that doing even a little bit, like using plant-based alternatives every once in a while, can have an important impact. But as we have said many times before on this show, changes can't just come from individuals. We need new systems and new ways to make food. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd love to live in a reality where I don't need to listen to a podcast to figure out what milk to buy. Beyond milk, there are so many areas in modern food production and farming that need to be re-examined. So what would this look like? Could we ever make a sustainable, perfect farm? Let's go back to where it all began. About 10,000 years ago, humans started to farm. This agricultural revolution was a turning point in our history that enabled people to settle, build, and create. In short, agriculture enabled the existence of civilization as we know it. And today, approximately 40% of our planet is farmland. But the first agricultural revolution was characterized by expansion and exploitation, feeding people at the expense of forests, wildlife and water, and destabilizing the climate in the process. That is not an option this next time around. In order to make agriculture sustainable, we need to increase the output without increasing our land use, all while protecting biodiversity, conserving water, and reducing pollution and greenhouse gases. So what could these future farms look like? Let's start with the basic layout of a farm. So conventional farming methods cleared large swaths of land and planted them with just a single crop, eradicating wildlife and emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases in the process. A more sustainable approach would correct that damage by intertwining crops and livestock with wild habitats. For example, in Costa Rica, farmers have intertwined farmland with their tropical habitat so successfully that they've helped to double the country's forest cover. Of course, every region is different and will require unique ways of integrating farms and local ecosystems. But this also means future farms may end up looking more haphazard than the farms we know today. Yet, under the surface, new technology would help these farms be more organized than ever. Teams of field robots might move along the crops and apply fertilizer in targeted doses. Inside the soil, hundreds of sensors could gather data on nutrients and water levels. This information would cut down unnecessary water use and tell farmers where they should apply more and less fertilizer, instead of just showering it across the entire farm and contributing to pollution. These high-tech solutions are just some of the various methods we'll need to make our farm sustainable. We're going to need low-cost, local interventions as well. But the great news there is that people all over the world are already working on solutions. In Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Nepal, farmers are experimenting with new approaches to rice production that could dramatically decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Rice is a staple food for 3 billion people and the main source of livelihood for millions of households. More than 90% of rice is grown in flooded paddies, which use a lot of water and account for 1-2% to 2 of the total annual greenhouse gas emissions. But these new approaches, which include using new strains of rice, irrigating less, and adopting less labor-intensive planting methods, have not only cut down on emissions, they've also increased crop yields and income for these farmers. In Zambia, the focus is on investing in regionally specific methods, such as intercropping local trees into their farms. These so-called fertilizer trees nourish the soil and increase crop yield. This and other methods will improve crop production, reduce forest loss, and improve livelihoods for local farmers. Triple threat. In fact, these efforts are projected to increase crop yield by almost a quarter over the next few decades. And in India, where up to 40% of post-harvest food is lost or wasted due to poor infrastructure, thousands of farmers are already using solar-powered cold storage capsules. This is some sci-fi stuff here. These capsules can help them preserve their produce for much longer. It will take all these methods and more to revolutionize farming. We need large producers to invest massively in high-tech solutions. And simultaneously, we'll need to expand access to lower-cost methods for small-scale farmers. This vision of future farming will also require a global shift toward more plant-based diets and huge reductions in food loss and waste. 
These both reduce pressure on the land and allow farmers to do more with what they have available. Optimizing future farms requires interventions from multiple directions and unprecedented global cooperation. That's not an easy feat, but it is crucial in order to feed humanity within the environmental limits of our planet. Whew, okay. Global food production is really complicated. But unless you plan to grow all of your own food, which, you know, I mean, respect if that's your game, this is a network that we all need to participate in. As with many environmental issues, we need to tackle this problem on two fronts, through our individual choices and through big systemic changes. New technologies are constantly being developed to help with the latter, which feels promising. I mean, have you all tried those plant-based fake meats? They're pretty good, if you ask me. I recommend a plant-based bolognese tossed in some mushrooms there. Very good. There's also clean meats that are being grown in labs, like totally animal-free, just science meat. I don't know. I'm really excited to try it. In terms of individual choices, like I said, even small changes in your diet can make a big difference. So, you know, maybe try buying oat milk one week instead of dairy milk. Get a group of friends to try Meatless Mondays or start shopping at your local farmer's market. There are lots of ways to incorporate a healthy and environmentally friendly diet. And it really does not have to mean a complete overhaul of all the things you love to eat. So that's it for this week. And actually, that's it for this season. Thank you so much for joining us, and I promise we'll be back very soon with more climate content. Though it will look a little different. We're going to be hearing directly from experts and leaders in the field speaking on the TED Countdown stage, including at the upcoming Countdown Summit in Edinburgh, Scotland. So this is, you know, actual experts instead of just me blabbing away about how rough it is out here. I hope you're feeling more informed about where we are and where we need to go, and hopefully a bit more optimistic about how we might get there. For me, I'm coming out of this feeling much more energized and empowered and maybe a little bit less existential. A little bit. Which is honestly surprising. Yeah, I really can't wait to hear from the people on the ground doing this important work. So thanks again for listening. More next season on how we can change climate change. You can also get involved by joining Countdown, TED's global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in collaboration with future stewards. Sign up for the Countdown newsletter at countdown.ted.com. TED Climate is produced and edited by Sheena Ozaki, mixed by Sam Baer, and hosted by me, Dan Cortler. This episode adapted two lessons originally produced in animated form by the TED Ed team. Which Type of Milk is Best for You was written by Jonathan J. O'Sullivan and Grace E. Cunningham, with fact-checking by Joseph Isaac. And Can We Create the Perfect Farm was written by Brent Loken, with fact-checking by Ed Germa. Both pieces were produced with editorial support from Emma Bryce and Elizabeth Cox. Special thanks to Alex Rosenthal, Gerta Jello, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan. <laughs>